Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Conrad Goodwin. I'm the communications manager here at ProPublica, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. For those who don't know us, ProPublica is a nonprofit investigative newsroom dedicated to exposing abuses of power and betrayals of the public trust by government, business, and other institutions, using the moral force of investigative journalism to spur real world impact. Last month, we published an investigation about the company behind We Buy Ugly Houses and uncovered questionable business practices. For today's event, we'll hear from the reporters and editors who worked on this story, and then we'll invite on outside experts to discuss our findings, consumer protections, and potential pathways to change. And now, allow me to introduce our first group of speakers. Bayard Duncan is an engagement reporter for ProPublica based in Oakland, California. He uses crowdsourcing tools to report on consumer protection issues. Reporter Anjanette Damon is part of ProPublica's Southwest Newsroom and lives in Reno, Nevada. She reports on housing, healthcare, and government accountability. Michael Squires is the editor for ProPublica's Southwest Newsroom based in Phoenix, Arizona, where he oversees five reporters. Squires will moderate this portion of the conversation, and then we'll hand the mic to Anjanette, who will moderate a panel of conversation with a consumer advocate, a real estate regulator, and a homeowner advocate. We'll also answer your questions. To ask a, que to ask a question at any point, you can do so by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and typing it there. I'll let Squires take it from here. Thanks, Connor, and uh, thanks to everybody who's uh, joined us to learn more about this important reporting. I think to get started, I would just like to ask Ann Jeanette how, how this uh, investigation got started, if you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I think it started with a curiosity that a lot of people in the public have that maybe a lot of our listeners here have had when you see those billboards and those signs plastered all over neighborhoods when you're getting text messages, phone calls, letters in your mailbox um, and digital ads, you're wondering what is this cash for houses kind of thing? What is this we buy ugly houses? And we were in a, a, a group meeting talking about housing and issues important to housing and Bayard and I and um, Sarah Smith, uh, one of the earlier reporters on this project, said uh, we we got to be we got to dig into this. Um, we let's find out who's behind these signs and how they do business and what the consequences of that might be. And that it was as simple as that, really. So, uh, Bayard, as you began to dig into this, what, what were some of the questionable practices that you began to see in your reporting? So as a first step, we did a couple of things. Um, we submitted records requests to the FTC and to um, attorneys general across the United States. And we also built a, what we call on the engagement team at ProPublica, a call out form, which is just an attempt to kind of crowdsource tips or expertise or just different uh, narrative evidence about a particular entity or company um, from a wide audience of people and just kind of see what comes in and categorize that. Um, we, we kept our call out pretty general because like Anjanette mentioned, you know, we were still kind of unsure about these entities, um, these broader, we buy houses, entities, real estate investors, cash buyers, uh, but it became clear pretty quickly based on our records requests and some of the call out responses that home investors was, um, you know, the self-proclaimed largest home buyer in the United States. They're among the, the most well-established, you know, they're, they're older than, than 20, 25 years old. Um, and through sort of subsequent records requests, we did, we did learn that indeed there is, you know, a, a series of lawsuits. There's a, a robust body of consumer complaints um, filed to state agencies and to the FTC about the company. And also just some sort of modest local news coverage of, um, of folks who had landed themselves in trouble, franchisees who had landed themselves in trouble sort of with those three things kind of to go on, that's when we started to dig a little bit deeper. So uh, as we do investigative reporting, we're often looking for harm, people who are being harmed by certain practices by either businesses or government. And Jeanette, were you able to identify like certain populations, individuals, types of individuals who were being targeted by this marketing? 
Yeah, I mean, I'll start off with the company's response. And when we interviewed or when we submitted questions to home investors, they were very clear that they do not target particular kinds of people or groups of people. Uh, their argument is that they target uh, the house with their advertising. So they're looking for particular types of properties that would be um, a part of their successful for their business model. Um, and, you know, the, they describe those homes as older homes and kind of the mid price point range. What we found when we started digging into the advertising, the types of people um, who uh, engaged with the cash home buyers, we found that often those homes were owned by people in desperate situations or vulnerable situations. Um, and, and these were the people that were signing contracts with uh, franchises of, of uh, home investors. Um, oftentimes, the types of homes that were targeted by home investors were owned by um, older adults. Uh, they look for neighborhoods with a high concentration of people who have a lot of equity in their houses. Um, often that means that you've owned your house for a long time and maybe don't have a, a really deep understanding of how much it's worth. And the fact that you have a lot of equity, even have the house paid off sometimes, means that you might be focused on a number, a cash number of how much money you might need to get you out of a certain situation and not necessarily how much money your house is worth. And so we saw in some of these interactions uh, with home investors franchises that they would really focus the conversation on that number and not necessarily what the house was worth. And so if you need $10,000 to travel across the country uh, to see your dying mom, that was the number that they were focusing on. If you paid, you know, $30,000 for your house in the 1960s or 1970s, then maybe $100,000 sounds like a lot to you when your house is really worth $500,000. Um, so yeah, people in, in desperate situations, the company teaches their franchises to find the pain and leverage that pain, um, present themselves as a solution to that pain. Um, so those are the types of people that uh, we found were doing, doing business with home investors. So Angela, you mentioned we had we began to engage with the company and they were answering our questions. But as we got toward getting closer to publication, the story did unfold in sort of an unusual way. Byer, can you just can you talk a bit about uh, how this played out? Yeah, absolutely. So here at ProPublica, we always ensure when we've got a big story coming out that um, we give whatever entity we're investigating ample time to respond in detail to a long list of detailed questions and findings. So um, we had been engaged with home investors for a couple of weeks uh, around just a lot of specific questions that we were giving them the opportunity to respond to. Um, and for the most part, they were forthcoming and they um, would respond to our questions in as much detail, in many cases, as much detail as they could. Um, but we also learned that behind the scenes, home investors at the time was uh, basically working proactively to undermine our reporting. Um, they had called a an all franchisee meeting um, held uh, sort of in a webinar, an online webinar, um, just a couple of weeks before our reporting came out in which um, the CEO, the COO, the general counsel, and then somebody involved in the, the um, investment firm that owns Homevestors all addressed franchisees and basically laid out a plan to, quote, bury our reporting using tools like um, SEO buys, uh, sort of competitive, um, you know, content generation, blog posts, social media posts. Um, and it was a very interesting sort of narrative arc of this hour long meeting, because at first they began by, you know, attempting to critique our reporting, though they didn't really raise any factual um, issues with it. Um, but pretty soon after that, they settled into a, um, an acknowledgement that they needed to change some of their policies, uh, which we had laid out, some of the uh, practices that their franchisees were engaging in, um, and ultimately concluded that um, uh, we had done solid reporting. Um, we didn't make anything up. And in fact, the CEO of Homevestors uh, said something along the lines of, this will make us a better company. Um, we had the pleasure of viewing this webinar. And um, we ended up writing a follow-up story about sort of their subsequent attempts to um, to undermine our reporting. So you, you could say that we had had in this in doing this project impact even before we published, which uh, is not always the case. And you know, it's obviously 
gratifying given that that's the aim of our work is to, to make things better. So the company it was committing to do that, but there's also been other uh, or discussion of other changes or you know uh, adjustments that need to be made to kind of address this problem. Angie, can you talk a bit about that? Yeah. Um, so first of all, I'll just address real quickly, specifically with the company, the practices that they wanted to change. Um, in a lot of other arenas, uh, timeshares, for example. Um, annuities, oftentimes there's a, uh, a, uh, um, a right to rescission or a time period where you can second guess a contract, maybe back out of it. Um, in this arena, that doesn't exist. Um, and furthermore, what, what home investors franchises were doing, and a lot of people that a lot of um, house flippers are doing, is they would record documents on the house's title, um, often called a memo of contract for sale that would really trap the person into the contract. So if they were second guessing things or thought, you know, maybe I'm being taken advantage of this, they wouldn't be able to back out of that very easily. And, and oftentimes the franchise would end up getting paid off, not just maybe cash that they had put in up front, but additional money um, just to get out of the contract. Um, and that was one of the more predatory behaviors that we identified in the reporting. And um, when Bayer talks about the practice the practices that the company decided to change, they uh, Home Investors has now prohibited its franchises from engaging in that particular behavior. Um, after the story ran um, just last week, um, the US the US Senate um, committee took notice of, of the reporting. Um, and when the director of the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau came to give his semi-annual semi report to Congress, um, he was asked about this reporting, asked what that agency can do um, to better protect consumers from predatory house flipping behavior. He said that um, he believed that the Department of Justice and um, all of the state's attorneys general should be made aware of this. Uh, shortly after that presentation to US senators, um, sent a letter to the National Association of Attorneys Generals asking them to uh, create a more coordinated approach to monitoring, looking for trends, predatory trends, um, and even urging state legislatures to create this so-called cooling off period or, or a, a, you know, a couple day breathing window where people can uh, assess the contract and decide whether or not to get out of it. All right, well, let's, let's look at a couple of questions that have come in from members of our audience. So one is, how can you stop receiving you know, these, this marketing email, whether it's a, you know, flyer that comes in the mail or emails or calls, uh, is there any sort of best practice on how to do that? I can uh, weigh in on that a little bit. There are options, you know, Homevestors has said that um, if you contact the number on their flyers and tell them you want to be removed, uh, I think they even provide on the flyer a, um, a, uh, a contact information to get, get yourself removed. Um, they will take you off, or more accurately, their uh, third-party sort of marketing, uh, in-house marketing agency will take you off. Now, in practice, does that really work? Um, you know, I've all I can say that is that I've read a lot of consumer complaints um, from people who seem to continue to receive flyers from home investors and from other um, house flippers like them. Uh, and so there's, I mean, there's a quite, there's a question of just asking the company to remove you. You can also go to the FTC's do not call registry, but frankly, it is sort of like trying to grab a fistful of sand. You know, there's all sorts of ways for these companies to, um, to sort of bypass those laws. There's loopholes. And also it's very possible that if you're tired of getting flyers, you tell a company to stop, there's just going to be other companies, other competing LLCs that might send you similar flyers. And it's kind of hard to tell them all apart. Um, so there are things you can do, but it is sort of a perpetual sort of Sisyphean battle if you really no longer want these uh, flyers landing in your mailbox. Um, Anjanette, why don't you take this on? There's a couple of questions that are sort of similar, and I'll try to combine them. Um, what is how, how do you uh, differentiate home investors from other, you know, whether they're home flippers or even like Zillow, other other people operating in sort of the home buying space? And then uh, this is sort of related. How would you how would you know if you're dealing with a franchise, a home investor's franchise, when you're contacted? 
Yeah, the, I think the difficulty in reporting this story and probably the difficulty that um, regulators and policymakers have is there's just not a lot of transparency out there. Um, so the difference is there's been a lot of attention lately to um, big private equity investment firms that are coming in and buying up large swaths of neighborhoods. Um, Zillow and companies like Zillow and Open Door um, were in the business also of, of buying houses en masse like that. Zillow has since uh, gotten out of that business because it turns out their algorithm wasn't so great at predicting the value of a house. Um, what and, and those activities present different kinds of problems than what we were looking at in this story. Um, oftentimes those buyers can be paying close to market value, um, but when you have large institutional buyers coming in and, and buying up a bunch of inventory and then um, becoming landlords and renting that out, that has a different kind of impact on, on, um, on the housing market. Um, as far as how you know whether or not you're dealing with home investors, that, that is um, a challenge. And I think even some home investors franchisees will acknowledge this. Uh, most of it comes back to their marketing. They spend an awful lot of money building the brand, we buy ugly houses. Um, so you'll see that tagline on the letters that you get in the mail. Um, you'll see that tagline on the billboards, on the signs. Um, often it'll be accompanied by Ugg the caveman. Um, and often their, their advertising will say home investors. Home investors is a little different than those bandit signs we call them that are kind of tacked up on telephone poles and say we buy houses oftentimes you'll be dealing with a different kind of or maybe not a different kind but a different flipper uh, often these um people who are operating in this space use a lot of the same tactics um but uh i also believe when the franchise which is operating under a different llc with a different name entirely. They'll often identify themselves as homevestors. Um, and the written material will probably have homevestors on it somewhere. So um, that way you can kind of know that, yes, I am dealing with a franchise of this big national company. Thanks. I'll, I'll combine a couple of other questions as well that have come in. And these are more related to kind of how we went about the reporting on this. Uh, when uh, apparently from a, uh, a journalist, uh, wondering if there are tips for pursuing reporting locally uh, on this topic. And then also, uh, this is sort of related, what are the documents? You know, we often put in records requests to get documentation to back up our investigations. Like what would those, what would be the documentation or the public records we'd be going after in this kind of investigation? Byer, why don't you talk to that, speak to that? Um, at the local level, I think the best place to start if you want to understand the behaviors and whether there have any been any complaints or violations about local franchisees in your area, the best document to start reviewing is the franchise disclosure document. And that is a publicly disclosed document in every state where Homevestors does business. You can get it from your uh, whatever agency in your state handles franchising. And it's a long, detailed document. Um, about 350 pages long that uh, uh, home investors as a, as a broader entity is required to submit, um, which will include information about their financials, in information about the success and failure rates of franchisees, uh, but most importantly, in, um, contact information for every uh, current and former franchisee in your city or state. Um, it has a list of all 1150, and then I'm not sure how far back it requires um, that they go with former franchisees, but I seem to remember maybe about 400, 500 former franchisees listed as well. And uh, you can just call those people um, if you wanna learn a little bit about sort of the franchise, uh, franchisee franchisor relationship with homevestors, or you can submit records requests to your attorney general or to the real estate commission in your state for complaints about those entities' names, or simply uh, Homevestors of America as an entity. One thing we noticed when we were submitting records requests is you don't always get um, a lot of hits when you're just searching Homevestors more broadly, because many times people will complain about the LLC, about the, the franchise name, and the franchise names don't have 
home investors in them. In fact, home investors forbids franchises from even using the term home buyer in their franchise names. So the best place to, if you want to do a sort of sweeping records request, the best thing to do is look at the franchise disclosure document, pull all the franchisees and see if there are complaints about all of those franchisees in your area. I would just jump in here to say not every state actually requires that a franchise disclosure agreement is filed with that state, but that doesn't mean you can't go to the states that do require it. So, you know, uh, Minnesota, uh, Wisconsin, California, um, there are a number of states that do. And as Bayard mentioned in that document, you do have a list of all the current LLCs that are operating in your area. So then you can use those LLC names sometimes to go and research property documents. You can research um, court documents, whether or not one of the practices that they engage in also is to file specific performance or breach of contract lawsuits. Um, so if you go to the courts and search not home investors, but search those individual LLC names that are operating in your area, um, you can get a, a, a good sense of of who's active there and who might be engaging in some of this more aggressive behavior. And just to, one more thing, just to be perfectly clear, um, if you're say in California, or excuse me, if you're say in a state, I'm not sure what state that does not require a franchise disclosure document, um, you can go get California's or Minnesota's or Wisconsin's. And that has the franchisees, not just in those states, but every single one in every single state. So another question that's coming is, is uh, I think, kind of interesting in that it looks at sort of the cultural aspect of this. There's the kind of fix and flip type tele reality TV shows that have been incredibly popular in recent years. H how do you see that playing? The question is, uh, you know, they, do they give credibility to these kinds of companies or, you know, make some people maybe more vulnerable in situations like this? I guess I'd add that to, to the question. I think one thing it does is it it is a marketing mechanism to get more people into the house flipping business. Oftentimes, these shows, these YouTube's, uh, YouTube gurus and videos um, are are selling systems for getting rich off of house flipping, um, and they present it as an easy business activity that you don't need a lot of upfront money for. Um, and I think the danger of that is real estate's a really complex environment. And so when a, a lot of people that don't really understand real estate or maybe don't have um, the education or the training to be made aware of what kinds of behaviors are predatory um, or more aggressive, a lot of them are kind of getting into the business. And one, that can result in um, in danger to the consumer. It's also kind of dangerous for the quote unquote investor or the person who's trying to get into house flipping and not really understanding what they're doing. Um, so uh, yeah, it kind of glamorizes that la lifestyle and, and uh, not just on the uh, cable TV shows, but uh, online, YouTube, social media, Instagram is full of these um, videos that are kind of glorifying this uh, lifestyle that house flippers say is available to you if you get into the business. And um, that can be problematic. I think it's worth very briefly noting too that home investors in line with its reputation for really scrupulous image management, um, they file a lot of lawsuits against folks who use the term um, uh, ugly houses or you know we buy ugly houses together. They have several trademarks. and. I think right now they're actually involved in a lawsuit with HGTV over a show called um, Ugliest House in America, uh, because I think that home investors feels that even though that's not a direct encroachment of their mark, um, they, it's close enough that it's threatening their business. So I think in December, they filed a lawsuit against HGTV for that. Great. That's a, a, a good stopping point for this part. Uh, thank you guys for sharing those behind the scenes details. Um, I'm going to keep Anjanette on the line um, and invite the rest of our speakers on, uh, but thank you Squires and Bayard uh, for contributing there. Um, so joining us for the next this next segment is uh, Sarah Mancini, uh, Grant Cody, and Kate Dugan. Sarah Mancini is co-director of advocacy at the Na National Consumer Law Center and focuses on racial justice issues surrounding home ownership, including access to mortgage loans and preventing foreclosures and home equity theft. She's based in Atlanta and for over 10 years represented homeowners in Atlanta Legal Aid's Home Defense Program. 
Grant Cody is an attorney and former assistant attorney general who currently serves as the executive director of the Oklahoma Real Estate Commission, which is, which is responsible for licensing and regulating Oklahoma's real estate industry. And lastly, Kate Dugan is a state, staff attorney in the Homeownership and Consumer Rights Unit at Community Legal Services of Philadelphia, where she represents low-income homeowners facing a variety of real estate issues, including property tax foreclosure, mortgage foreclosure, and tangled titles. I'll let Anjanette take it from here. Thanks again for joining us. I want to turn this portion of the conversation to um, kind of what people, individuals can do to protect themselves, what family members can do to help protect family members, and then what regulators and policymakers can do to look at this environment. Um, and if there's any kind of changes or tweaks that could be made um, there to protect consumers as well. Um, and so the first question, which I'll kind of open it up to all of you to, to um, weigh in on, is why is it difficult for regular people to protect themselves from unfairness in the process of selling their home? Um, Sarah, do you want to start? Sure. Thank you so much, much, Anjanette. And it's great to be with you all. I think what makes this so difficult for regular people is that many homeowners do not have an accurate understanding of the value of their house, the fair market value, particularly if they've lived in the home for a long time. And another thing that contributes to this is the under appraisal of particularly homes and communities of color, that for a long time, we have not had accurate appraisals of these homes and there's been under appraisal and bias in the system. And so that really makes people even more vulnerable to being persuaded to sign a contract to sell their home for less than it's worth if they don't have a clear sense of what their home is worth. And another thing that makes it challenging is that consumer education is really difficult to effectively do ex ante before people really need it. It's, it's not effective because people are busy. So they're, they're, gonna, they're not gonna go read up about how to sell their home until they're in the moment where they need to do it. And the scammers are so, the people that are doing this business model of direct purchasing of homes for less than they're worth are so effective at reaching people and convincing them to sign on the dotted line. And so it's very hard for people who are consumer advocates and homeowner advocates to get the information to them before they sign a contract. And Kate, what would you add to that? Yeah, um, in addition to what Sarah said, Anjanette, I think you pointed this out really well, is that uh, homefesters and other wholesalers uh, target people in really vulnerable situations. Um, and when people you know, feel like their back is against a wall, they may make a decision uh, without thinking it through, um, you know, in a way that somebody should be able to think such a huge decision through. We know that these companies target people in property tax foreclosure who have big liens against their property, um, who need home repairs, and who maybe aren't aware that a lot of places have help. Um, you know, in, in Philadelphia, there is there is help for you if you owe property taxes, but uh, a home investor's rep is not going to tell you that. Uh, so people don't have all the information and they think that this is the only answer. Uh, we know that there's, you know, these are these are very convincing salespeople. And, you know, we have a whole area of law, consumer law, that protect people against high pressure sales techniques uh, because of this. Uh, I mean, the problem is that these these homeowners are selling something. So it's sometimes a little difficult to frame them as consumers and bring them, you know, within the protections of existing consumer laws. Um, but this is the the concept of a high pressure sales technique isn't new and we've been trying to protect people against it in all sorts of areas for years. And Grant, what are your thoughts? Sure, I'll just add on. I think obviously there's a large gap in the sophistication of the parties when we're talking about wholesale transactions, right? There's one group that's coming to you with a contract that they created. So inherently it's going to be in their interest. And I think what we see here and at the Oklahoma Real Estate Commission oftentimes is that people simply don't know what they're signing. And I think the action of coming to somebody and saying, I wanna buy your home, here's a purchase agreement, when in fact that purchase agreement is really more of a marketing agreement, you know, the title of it, purchase agreement, and the pitch of I'm gonna buy your home is really disingenuous most of the time. So the lack in bargaining power, the discrepancy with education, and frankly, as, as Kate and Sarah alluded to, you know, the need that many of these people have uh, all contributes to, frankly speaking, just a lack of, of fairness and, a high barrier to understanding. And so that's why we see uh, so many issues that we see and also the lack of regulation on this topic as well. 
Yeah, I want to take just a moment to kind of define some terms here because there's different kinds of behaviors um, that we're addressing uh, in our conversation. Um, when you when we talk about cash buyers, people who are offering cash for homes, they can come in a wide variety of different types. Um, we sometimes refer to them as fix and flippers or house flippers. Um, a lot of times consumers might hear this and expect that uh, a cash buyer is coming and buying their house, fixing it up and selling it again, right? Um, and then there's this other whole arena called wholesaling. And Grant, um, I know we're going to talk with you a little bit more about this um, a minute in the conversation, but I just want to kind of define this wholesaling activity is when you sign a contract to sell your house with an individual, that person then sells the contract to another investor and for a higher price and takes a chunk of money out of that. That's a very simple explanation of what's going on there. So that person that you're signing the contract with never actually takes ownership of your house. Um, and and it's uh, it, it can lead to all sorts of problems that we'll get into. But just to, as we're talking about cash buyers, house flippers, wholesalers, that's kind of a little bit of background for what we're discussing here. Um, and so my next question, um, Sarah, if there's when you talk with people in the industry, they often say, look, there is definitely room for our kind of business here. Sometimes there are people who absolutely need to sell their house quickly. Sometimes they're willing to trade um, money for convenience uh, and lots of different kinds of situations. If you happen to have a house that might be difficult to sell or you might need to do it quickly, how should you approach doing that? So I push back a little bit on the idea that this business model is serves a role. I think that there may be instances where that's true, but in the current housing market, if someone needs to sell their house, even if they need to sell it quickly, we have a very hot market right now. And even if someone lists their home with a traditional real estate agent or realtor, you can sell your house pretty quickly if you price it right. Um, so I think if someone is feeling like they've got to sell quickly or um, they don't have the money to make repairs or their house might be difficult to sell, I still think the best recommendation is to, first of all, do your own research about what your house is worth um, through online uh, uh, valuation websites like Zillow and ePraisal and HomeSnap. Um, and then talk to a licensed real estate agent about what they think your home would sell for. And if you're in a situation where you really think you want to take a discounted price in exchange for speed or convenience, just be armed with that information so that you really know what you're giving up. Um, and that a realtor can tell you, is this really necessary to make this trade off? Because inherently, if you list your home for sale publicly with a licensed real estate agent, you're going to open it up to the public market. And in theory, that would bring you the highest and best value. Any off market sale has a risk that it's gonna be discounted because they're, they're not opening it up to any um, outside buyers. And just sticking with you, I want to kind of switch um, to the kind of the individual perspective to more of the regulatory focus on what policymakers can do. And um, first, Sarah, if you could kind of give us the lay of the land about what kinds of regulations exist out there. I mean, our reporting found that this is in a lot of jurisdictions, there are no regulations out there. Um, so can you kind of give us the lay of the land and then I'll go to, to Kate and Grant to talk about um, some specific measures that have been done in their communities. Yes, happy to do that and give that that lay of the land. I will just say one thing so that I don't forget, which is that a lot of folks who are in distress, um, there is relief available. Either if you're behind on your mortgage, there's relief through the homeowner assistance fund programs that are in all the states. Uh, there can be property tax assistance. Um, finding a HUD certified housing counselor can help people get a loan modification. So I wanted to be sure to mention that because to some extent, when we talk about policies that would prevent undervalued home sales or high pressure home sales, those are all the same policies that help people who are in financial distress. So whether it's property tax relief, mortgage relief or foreclosure avoidance, um, laws that deal with foreclosure rescue scams, those are all in the same family of laws. And various states have protections and there's also some protections at the federal level, but it's really important to get legal help from free legal services office or a HUD certified housing counselor, which you can find at HUD.gov. Um, as far as laws that specifically regulate the business practice of direct cash purchase of homes, or what I call high pressure home sales, 
um, or as you referred to, Anjanette, as you said, there are different practices here, wholesalers, all of that world, there is not much. There are not very many states or localities that have tried to legislate. And I hope that the, the piece uh, that ProPublica has done here will call more attention because I think there's a need for much more. The places that I know of are Illinois, Texas, Oklahoma, and Philadelphia. Um, and I know Grant and Kate can speak to Oklahoma and Philadelphia. I'll just say that in Texas, uh, that in Texas and Illinois, the approach has been related to wholesalers and requiring um, either licensure of wholesalers or some type of disclosure about what the wholesaler is doing. Uh, but again, it's pretty limited. Uh, and I think that we really need to see more focus on how to solve these problems. Yeah, and that's great. To, um, we're so lucky to have Kate with us here because uh, Philadelphia has really kind of led the way in some um, pretty uh, strong uh, consumer oriented laws or homeowner since, yeah, you're not really buying something, are you? Um, homeowner protection laws. Kate, can you talk about what Philly has done? Sure, and, and I think it's important to sort of uh, spotlight something Sarah said, which is that um, you know, we kind of think there there are two kinds of people we're trying to protect with our law. Um, it's people who want to stay in their home and neighborhood and, you know, need help either through property tax relief or home repairs. I mean, I live in a city where every house is 100 years old, so everybody needs repairs. Um, or just, you know, people who are vulnerable and, and will sign anything a friendly person puts in front of them. Um, so that's, that's, you know, first people who want to stay in their house. And then there are people who, like, truly do want to sell their houses. Like, you know, our my job as a, a homeowner attorney is to like try to keep people in their houses, but I acknowledge that sometimes you want to sell, sometimes you want to retire to Florida or somewhere warmer. Um, and it's it's also about protecting those people and making sure that equity they've built up over years goes into their pockets and not the pockets of an investor. Um, so with that in mind, um, in late 2020, Philadelphia passed what we think may be the first in the nation, um, you know, package of laws to protect uh, homeowners from predatory wholesalers and investors. And uh, just very quickly, because this is like its own hour talk, um, there, are, there are sort of like four main areas of the law. And the first area is that uh, before a, after a person is presented with an agreement of sale, um, they have a three day cooling off period before they can sign that agreement of sale. So they have to have agreement in hand for three days. Um, and what this does is like it lets them show it to their families. Maybe, you know, it's a senior and their child finds it on the kitchen table and says, hey, mom, what's this? Um, and that's that's better to find before you've signed the contract than after. Um, that law also requires a disclosure form listing resources like property tax relief and repair programs. So if people think that I need to sell because I'm in distress, it gives them a chance to maybe call a hotline and talk about whether there are other options. Um, it also requires the uh, wholesalers to be licensed. So Philadelphia and a lot of other cities require all sorts of businesses to be licensed. Um, anybody who is not a licensed real estate agent uh, because we cannot require those people to be licensed, must license with Philadelphia as a property wholesaler. Uh, and that gives us, you know, more information. Uh, it brings their behavior into, you know, some sort of regulatory oversight uh, and, and it imposes a pretty minimal set of ethical requirements that they have to follow in dealing with homeowners. Um, the, the, the third and important part of this is if a, if a wholesaler is not licensed, which plenty in Philadelphia have not gotten licenses, um, a homeowner has a right to cancel the contract up until the agreement of sale. So there, there is this limited right of rescission in Philadelphia that if you have signed an agreement of sale with an unlicensed wholesaler, you do have a right to rescind up until the day of closing. Uh, which has been a really important tool for, for a lot of our homeowners. Uh, and then the fourth, and I think most popular, uh, you know, I guess um, among city residents is that we established a do not solicit list, which I also believe exists in New York um, for people who just don't want to be contacted by these wholesalers. So that's our, that's our four part long, you know, sort of still seeing how that unfolds. I think that's one of our most common uh, audience questions so far is how do I get off these lists? I don't want the text messages and the phone calls anymore. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Grant, could you talk about what Oklahoma has done recently? Sure, absolutely. In November of 2021, Oklahoma passed the Predatory Real Estate Wholesaler Prohibition Act. 
And basically what we did is we took a look at the landscape and we, what we saw was, as Sarah alluded to, basically two schemes to address this have emerged nationwide so far and really only in a handful of minority states. So you've got states that follow a disclosure approach, which say if you're going to do this type of transaction, you have to include a disclosure in the written agreement saying this is what I'm doing. I think when we looked at that, the inadequacy uh, became very clear very quickly, which is that number one, that disclosure pretty much already has to be in there in order to actually do a wholesale transaction, right? Because that person who's getting you to sign the agreement needs to have some language in that agreement that says, you grant me the right to market and assign this for profit to someone else. So we kind of felt like, you know, the language is already in there and it's become clear to us that people are not really able to read and comprehend uh, the magnitude of that small piece of language, which, which oftentimes can be buried, you know, on page four of a six page agreement and not really uh, catch your eye the way that maybe the sales price would. So when we looked at that, we felt like, okay, something else needs to happen here. And for us, what we like to do is make sure that our regulation is proportional to what's going on. And so for us, if you look at the actual conduct or the action of what's going on in this type of transaction, it really mirrors what real estate professionals are doing. They are marketing a property that they do not own uh, for profit. And so, you know, really the discrepancy or the difference is, is rather than, you know, traditionally marketing the property itself, you're marketing the contract, as you mentioned before. But at the end of the day, you're, you're making money by marketing a property you don't own. And so for Oklahoma, we took a look at that and said the conduct, the actual action is really identical to what real estate professionals are doing. So uh, I think we became one of the first states, if not the first state, uh, to enact a licensure requirement, which said, if this is what you're going to do and you're going to publicly market these type of deals, you have to get a real estate license. And why that's so important is number one, it requires a, a, fe a federal background check. So we know, okay, you know, if you have a felony or something like that, you're not going to probably be able to get a license, which makes sense. You don't want someone with certain types of felonies getting unsupervised access to a home, most likely. Uh, the second thing it does is it requires some basic education to be completed and an examination, a national examination to be passed, just to make sure there's a minimum level of, you know, professionalism and education. And then most importantly, when you get a license, it brings you within consumer protection laws and license law which is gonna mandate certain minimum protections for the, for the consumer. And it's also going to give free avenues for our consumers to file complaints, to get help in the event that they are uh, preyed upon or somebody who's working with them violates a state law or rule. So these protections have been in place in many states since like the 1950s. Um, we understand why you need to protect homeowners with you know with the largest asset and oftentimes one of the biggest financial transactions that they'll do in their lifetime that not only affects them, but their families as well. So there's a really, really important and tons and tons of law and history on protecting this area. So for Oklahoma, we enacted that licensure requirement in order to level the playing field and target the conduct and say, you know, we're going to make sure you're being treated the exact same. Thank you. And that, that's a nice segue, actually, to this next question. Um, so much of real estate is, lo is regulated on the local level, city, county, and state level. Um, but I'm wondering if there's a role for Congress or the federal government to play here. And one of our sources recently um, mentioned um, the SAFE Act, which was passed in the wake of the financial crisis, which kind of did a little bit of both, where you have a federal law that's compelling states um, to, um, in this case, license and regulate mortgage loan originators um, to, again, kind of ensure that modicum of education and to provide um, a layer of oversight. Um, uh, Sarah, would something like this work, something like the SAFE Act work uh, in this environment for wholesalers or house flippers, cash buyers? So I think when we're thinking of this landscape of actors, there is a role for possible federal legislation. It could be done. It could be addressed at the federal level or the state level, or in many places at the local level. So if there were political will, um, I think a federal statute could be very helpful and meaningful. And, and, and we could think about what would be the most impactful thing that could be done at the federal level. So, and I do think that something like the SAFE Act is worth exploring um, in terms of requiring states to enact a licensure regime. That is one way it could be done. Um, I think at the National Consumer Law Center, we are still thinking through, um, along with our colleagues around the country that represent low-income homeowners, what would be the most impactful way to prevent these harms? Um, and I have a number of ideas about that, but I do think it could be done at either the federal level or the state level. 
Kate, can you talk a little bit about why it's difficult to, um, one, identify predatory practices, but um, what gets in the way of creating regulatory fixes either uh, at any level of government? Yeah, so um, as I said, even though Philadelphia requires wholesalers to be licensed, most of them have not gotten licenses. Uh, these practices happen in people's homes, behind closed doors. Uh, we often don't hear about it until people have already sold their houses. Um, and as you pointed out, uh, these investors hide behind layers of LLCs. It is extremely hard to track down who is doing what. Um, and you know, just anecdotally in Philadelphia, a lot of these investors um, develop sort of like a, they're friendly and folky and they're on a first name basis. So a lot of our clients call and say, hey, I talked to a guy named Joe um, and we don't know Joe's last name. And, you know, the signature on the agreement of sale is a scribble. Uh, and it's it's very hard to track down until we're in litigation where we never, ever want to be. Um, it's, it's hard to track down information about who's doing what. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of investors are behaving in a way that, you know, it's not surprising that they don't want their behavior connected to them. Um, so it's it's hard to regulate somebody you can't find. Um, so that's that's been a challenge. Um, and it's, you know, with licensing requirements and, you know, with increased access to records um, through lawsuits and financial disclosure laws, um, you know, I think I think we're getting there, but that has been a big challenge for us. And I want to ask one last question of, of Grant before we get into some of uh, some audience questions. Um, where where should the rails be? Like, where should the line be drawn when we're talking about regulating this this industry? Yeah, that's a great question because <clears throat> it's important to note that the act of assigning a contract for profit is actually very common in commercial real estate. So I think one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that this practice does actually have like a longstanding application. But what we're specifically talking about is kind of basically circumventing license laws that exist. Because I'll tell you what, if you look at every state, every state pretty much has a requirement that people who are uh, wholesaling properties are marketing contracts for sale uh, or assignable contracts for sale. Like most of the states, if you look at their actual statutes, it really does fall within the purview of their license requirements. So for example, uh, the South Carolina Real Estate Commission this year issued a memorandum which basically said, hey, we're going to interpret the word, our definition of broker to include this practice because when we've looked at it, similar to Oklahoma, it's really the same thing. You're, you're marketing properties that you don't own for, for, for a profit. So I think, you know, as far as where should the guardrails be, I think the starting point for that is that they should be, there should be an effort state by state to bring uniformity to this type of practice and to close some of the loopholes that are being used. Um, I'm sure if you look in other states, just like in Oklahoma, what you'll see is, you know, people get around, like uh, Kate mentioned that, you know, a lot of people don't want to get a license. That's because they don't want to have that accountability, right? They don't want to have to operate within a regulatory framework. So they do things like uh, get a power of attorney from a homeowner so that they can use that power of attorney to circumvent license law requirements. So to me, I think the guardrails need to start with let's bring this practice into uniformity and let's close some of those loopholes that people are using to evade uh, regulatory framework, oversight, and frankly, free avenues for help for consumers. Thank you. So our first question um, from the audience that I wanted to address, and, and it's it it's more geared towards the franchise model, which Homevestors um, operates under specifically. Uh, but this um, particular questioner wanted to know if the franchise model is a way for companies to uh, reap profits while diffusing the responsibility for that profit driving behavior. So you have kind of a corporate office and then you have individual businesses and it, it might be easy for either side to point fingers at, oh no, that's corporate's fault. Oh no, that's the individual franchise's fault. Um, do any of you have any thoughts on that? Maybe I can start on this one. I think that that may be the reasoning. You know, it's hard to look into the, the minds of people that develop these types of business models. I do think that there are legal arguments that could be used to tie franchisees back to the franchisors. And so it may not be effective actually to shield um, the, the company that ultimately created the business model from liability, but it is it does seem very likely to me that that's the intent. Uh, I would just argue that there are, you know, if there's enough acting together in concert, uh, there still could be legal challenges that would be brought. And, and oftentimes I think it's appropriate to explore those types of arguments. 
I will say that it does make things, it makes it especially hard to gather information, you know, if you're gearing up to, to litigate, um, it certainly operates, even if it doesn't actually uh, shift responsibility, uh, it makes it hard for a person to call the right place to say, like, who's the name, what's the number, um, because I can imagine people getting bounced back and forth between franchise and franchisee. Yeah, and I would just add on, I think that's, you know, generally speaking, one of the benefits uh, from the perspective of a, of, a, of a franchise, right, of a model is how do we expand our market share, but, you know, lower our liability to a degree. And I think when we make judgments or we look at groups like that, one of the things that we need to do is take a good look at what training and what materials they're providing and, and the context within that relationship. Thank you. This is a question that I've gotten probably most frequently since this story is, has run um, emails and phone calls and text messages from family members or even neighbors um, of older adults um, who are like, how do I protect the older adults in my family or my neighborhood? Um, and what should I say um, to them if, if they do approach me and say, hey, what should I do if a cash buyer is, has approached me? Um, Kate, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, so I, I would do a lot of what Sarah mentioned earlier, help them arm themselves with information. Um, it is not giving legal advice to somebody to say, hey, you should know the value of your house before you sell it. Uh, you know, a lot of real estate offices, you know, if you walk in, we'll do a market analysis uh, of your home for you for free without you committing to selling. Um, you can, you, even if Zillow's estimates are, you know, of varying reliability, uh, you can look at your county assessment. Again, you know there are, there are pros and cons to using that number, um, but you can also use websites to look at recent sales in your neighborhood to see what other people sold for and did they use a real estate agent. Um, and that just that that sometimes puts a number into people's heads that is far different um, than what they thought. And also just make sure that they have access to the kinds of things that could keep them in their house if they want to stay in their house. You know, talk to the person figure out is this a, do I want to retire to somewhere warmer conversation or, a, you know, my plumbing is broken and I think I need to leave situation, like try to track them into like the, do I want to stay or do I want to go um, and, and sort of, you know, push them in, in a good direction from there. So there is a way to be a supportive neighbor there. Yeah, thank I, you. Anjanette, can I add one point yes. on the question? Mm -hmm. Um, I think everything Kate said is right. And the one other message I would really like to put in people's minds is to talk to your friends and relatives about the fact that if something is a good deal, it can wait for you to get independent advice before you sign on the dotted line. And that in most states, if you sign a piece of paper, you can be bound by what you signed potentially, um, even if you didn't understand it, and even if the person sitting across the table lied to you about what it said. Unfortunately, I've heard from a number of low-income homeowners that they were told this piece of paper is not a binding contract, it's an offer, um, you know, and that can be wrong. So if someone is pushing them and asking them to sign something, anything that's a good deal can wait. If they are telling you they won't leave until you sign it, it's a red, it's a big red flag. And I had a mentor who represented low-income homeowners for 42 years, um, same as Bill Brennan. And he used to say, people can rob you with a pen and paper just as surely as they can rob you with a loaded gun. So just be aware that by signing something, you can lose your rights. Um, so don't sign until you get someone independent to look at it. Yeah, I would just echo that 100%. You need a, a second opinion, right? I wouldn't go buy a car and walk into the first dealership I walked into and pay sticker price without maybe calling or visiting another uh, dealership to get an idea of, you know, what the market looks like. Uh, but the biggest thing is that, you know, at the end of the day, people are not, people don't go to law school. They're not really equipped to read these complex legal agreements. So you need to get uh, somebody qualified to take a look at that. And frankly, in today's day and age, it's very simple to do that. There's legal aid resources, there's real estate professionals, there's real estate commissions and associations. Uh, it's very simple to get someone to take a look at that and to tell you, hey, do you see any red flags in here? And then again, communicate what your goals are. Um, but the, I, I wanna commend Kate on you know Philadelphia's cooling off period because I think what we see in Oklahoma is most of the big issues that we see come from high pressure sales tactics where people sign an agreement thinking and they're, they're pitched verbally on what it is but what they find out is, hey, they signed something a little bit different. So you have to get an independent legal review from somebody. And frankly speaking, I mean, you have to treat this agreement like what it is. It, it's probably the most, one of the most important agreements that you'll ever sign, so. 
Yeah, that really stuck out at me too when there's a lot of discussion about rescission periods and that's after you've signed the contract. But in Philadelphia's case, you need that three days, you get the offer, you have three days to think about it before you sign something. Um, a couple of our audience members, Sarah, have asked, you know, what happens if I have already signed that contract or a loved one has signed that contract? Like what, what can I do if this is, if we really need to get out of this contract? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think the answer is get legal advice as soon as possible. And for people to be aware that there are free legal services providers around the country. Um, if you just Google find legal help, uh, you're going to be looking for a dot org. I'm not sure the website. I know that the um, Legal Services Corporation has a lookup website and, and maybe ProPublica could put that on the website. But essentially, for, for most folks who are homeowners below a certain income level, you may be able to get free legal advice from a legal services attorney in your city. Um, and if not, it, you know, talking to a licensed realtor is also a good way. But essentially, if you've already signed a contract, just be aware that there can be legal defenses, but it's helpful to act as soon as possible. Um, and, and ultimately what sometimes happens is people don't wanna go forward to close and then they get sued for specific performance. So that the, the company will sue them to try to force them to go forward. And at that moment, if you get sued, you absolutely need legal advice immediately because there's a deadline to respond to that lawsuit. And I think in every state in the country, there are potential legal claims and defenses that you could raise to, to fight back. Um, so it's, it's not hopeless at that point, even when you get sued, but there is always a deadline to respond to any lawsuit. And if you don't respond in time, you lose by default. Yeah, I, I would agree with everything Sarah said. And you know, even if you, if you call legal aid and they can't call you back for a week, get to the courthouse and file an answer. You do not wanna miss a deadline. Um, because a lot of these investors operate in such high volume, they do not want to pay their lawyers to litigate. If they know you're going to fight back, they may be willing to walk away. They may be willing to settle with you, but you need to show up and fight. Um, you need to get something on the record. Um, you know, a lawyer can jump in later, uh, but like, don't wait. Really do it as fast as possible. People can, you can show up and file things on your own. Um, you can represent yourself, you know, maybe while you're waiting for a lawyer to call you. That's such a good point. A lot of the lawsuits that we saw for specific performance or breach of contract ended up in a default judgment against the homeowner who um, just wasn't equipped to uh, fight that lawsuit. Um, and they either lost the house or were on the hook for a, a good chunk of money um, just through a default. Um, it, so here's, here's the last question, um, which I think is a good one. It's something that I've been uh, curious about as well. And that's how um, the quote unquote traditional model of real estate sales doesn't always work for all people. Um, it can be expensive. Um, a lot of times people in um, black or brown neighborhoods don't have access to realtors. Sometimes there's certain neighborhoods that real estate agents just don't even want to go into or try and work with. Um, so in some industries, disruptive companies make the industry more efficient, affordable, or accessible. Is there any real estate sales model or could wholesaling ever be sufficiently regulated so as to result in good disruption for the real estate sales industry? Who wants to take that one on first? I, I could sort of frame the question a little more because I think I'm the one that submitted that to you. It was a question somebody asked me and I'm not sure I ever had a good answer. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping to get your thoughts. Um, one, of, one of the points of frustration, and, and so my office is located in North Philadelphia, which is you know primarily black neighborhood, um, primarily low-income neighborhood, there are no real estate offices around here. So I feel bad telling somebody go to a real estate office um, because a lot of realtors do not want to work with homes worth under $100,000 is on the commission model. Um, so, so I will say that our law has gotten the attention of the real estate industry and actually a commitment from some local offices to try to do a better job working in these neighborhoods. Uh, maybe a new realtor um, you know, lawyers are required to do pro bono work or low cost work. Maybe there is a model there for, you know, that traditional commission model to come in to neighborhoods and, and do, you know, represent homeowners who want to sell their homes. Um, so, but other than that, you know, sometimes, sometimes new technologies or practices can be great. Um, unless they're completely unregulated. And then, you know, it's like, how do we bring them into regulation? But I, I'd be love anybody else's thoughts. 
Grant, go ahead. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and I'll just say, you know, as it stands, no, I don't think that this practice is a good disruptor. You have to have regulations in place that at a minimum require these individuals and, and people who are doing this, right, to uh, have the same minimum commitments and requirements and disclosures that other real estate professionals have. So unless there's a similar playing field with the regulations that are being followed, I don't see a positive disruption here. I think when we talk about positive disruption today, what we're talking about is, are you making it easier? Are you making it more cost effective? And am I still getting the same level of service protection or, or convenience? And I think what you see here is uh, a sales tactic that's promoted as being easier and promoted as being more efficient, when in fact, that's really not very fair because at the end of the day, the property's still getting marketed and you're still going through the same real process that you're going through. So I personally don't think uh, that the practice is a good disruption. And I think even if you bring those individuals within the purview of existing license law, at the end of the day, you end up back where you started with kind of the same playbook being uh, run out. So I don't see it as a positive disruption. And as far as uh, real estate brokerages and offices not being in some of these communities, I think that's absolutely true. But I also think we need to recognize uh, the trend that we're seeing across the country right now, which is getting rid of physical real estate locations and offices, right? It's, it's really kind of becoming less common that if I want to sell my home, I walk down to a real estate office and meet with a professional. Nowadays, we see companies, we see states like Illinois that allow uh, offices that don't actually have to have a physical brick and mortar location anymore. You can be a, a cloud company, so to speak. So I think uh, companies and, and, and individuals have taken notice because of how much market share has been taken from them in some of these lower income neighborhoods or properties that might be at a lower value. And I think because of the market that we have with the incredible demand and the lack of, of in inventory and supply, I do think that you're actually going to see that more brokerages and realtors and licensed professionals are making themselves available in these neighborhoods. So I always think a great place to start is simply going to your real estate commission website and looking up some licensed companies or calling your real estate commission and asking for help on where to start with looking for a help with a real estate professional. Great. Uh, that's our time for today. I want to thank all the speakers. Uh, this was an incredibly informative conversation, and I really hope our listeners found it helpful. Um, I also want to thank everyone in the audience who took the time to be with us today. And from all of us at ProPublica, thanks for joining, and we'll see you next time.